my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. In the last episode, I spent quite a bit of time doing some science scrounging, admittedly grabbing some pretty low-lying fruit. But the reason was is because I wanted enough science to be able to unlock electronics here. And the reason why I wanted electronics is because I wanted that Communitron 8888 antenna, which can reach all the way out to Duna, because I do have a Duna launch window coming up very shortly, and I want to do something with that. Now, according to Kerbal Construction Time, that's going to take over nine days. I don't like that. So I'm going to take my upgrade point that I just earned and put that towards research and development. And that cuts the construction time or the research time down to four days and four hours. That's going to be great. Once that is done and out of the way, then I should be able to get started on building me a Duna probe. In the meantime, we still got lots of other stuff to do, starting off here with the Kerstock 5. Now, shortly after launching the Korion, which is my permanent vessel in, in space, which is now occupied by Jebediah and Glafia, uh, I began to realize that one of the issues I have with that particular vessel is that those Kerbals have no way down if something goes wrong. They have no lifeboat. They are stuck there in that vessel because that vessel is incapable of coming back down to the surface of Kerbin safely. So the idea here was to launch the Kerstock 5 and to attach it uh, to the Kerion. So, you know, not, not so that when the Kerion goes off and does missions that it'll be with it. It won't. It'll stay in orbit behind with the Kerion, but it will always be there empty in case those guys needed to come down for whatever reason. Well, between when I put this in the building queue and right now, that mission plan had changed because another one of these uh, rescue a Kerbal out of space, out of low orbit contracts came up. And as you can see down here on the left, I have her already targeted. Her name is Stella. Stella! Not Stella, but Stella! i sorry, I can't resist with the Stella! Okay, I won't do that anymore. But, uh, so I changed the whole plan of this mission. The mission is to rescue Stella, get her back down. That seemed to make more sense. And you have certainly seen me do these rescue missions before, so I don't think anything will be served by belaboring it. So let's just cut on over to our encounter with Stala's pod. And I was thinking as I was doing this too, is like, you know, I still got quite a lot of Delta V left. We've got about 475 meters per second of Delta V left now that I've brought it over to a stop. And uh, I thought, well, you know, why don't... We pay a visit over to the Karayan, and what I can do is I can transfer uh, some of the fuel, that excess fuel from the Kerstock into the Karayan again. Uh, it doesn't, all, it, all the Karayans, or all the Kerstock here has to do is deorbit itself, so I might as well transfer over its excess fuel. You can see here, by the way, that Stala is another pilot. I'm rather swimming in pilots now. I do have three scientists, but only two engineers so I'd really love to pick up another engineer so I'm going to start being a little bit more picky with my um, rescue Kerbal contracts and unless that Kerbal is an engineer um, I'm just going to let it go and if I don't end up getting an engineer soon I suppose I'll just end up having to hire one but for now we'll just set up our rendezvous burn with the Karayan which Unfortunately, it turned out to be about four hours away. Yeah, the two vessels aren't really very well placed for this, but, but that's okay. Uh, you know, and through the magic of editing, we can just get ourselves straight to our encounter. Okay, so the plan here is just to connect up with the Karai and transfer most of our fuel over, and then just get Stala back down. Ooh, electricity is running out. Electric charge is running out, so uh, best get this over with. Shoot, I've reduced my uh, target velocity down to just 0.1 meters per second, so maybe I should do a little bit burning in the direction of the Karayan. Let's see here. And, oh, electric charge is depleted. Shoot. And if you look at the, I don't know if you can see the ship, but if you look at the nav ball, you can see that uh, I'm just kind of tumbling. I can't control it. Unfortunately, the lights are out because, well, I've got no electricity, so it might be hard for you to see, but uh, I have absolutely there no control whatsoever, no attitude control. The, so we'll switch over to the Quran. Ooh, what the hell is this? 
from the flight computer out of power cannot target target none on schedule oh what a mess okay the flight computer is from remote tech flight that's the remote tech flight computer which i'm not using but it's clear oh wow it's still going <laughs> it's clearly kind of confused so we're just going to try and ignore all of that white block of text there on the left there and what we're going to do is we're going to use the Korean to uh, scoot on over to where the curse stock is because the curse stock is out of power and completely useless yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't paying any attention to the solar panel orientation, and I'm deep into the night side of Kerbin, so that's too bad. And it's too bad you can't see the curse dock other than the little uh, icon there, the little waypoint marker there, because it's so dark. But if it wasn't dark, I wouldn't be out of electricity now, would I? Oh, I can see a bit of glow there on the limb of, the, of Kerbin, so hopefully the sun will be coming up pretty soon. You know, I am getting used to these RCS sounds. I will admit that. I'm starting to actually maybe even grow to like them. Again, those RCS sounds coming from the Interstellar mod in its most recent update. Alright, come on Jeb, let's get down there. By the way, I, I orient the craft um, when I'm doing these sort of maneuvering I always orient the craft so that the craft is up according to the screen and that makes it a lot easier to tell which way is uh, you know which way to thrust with the RCS thrusters so I'm looking at the front of the craft which confuses me just a little bit and the, re the way I know which end of the Korine is up is I put the radiator on the top sort of a dorsal part oh now you can sort of see the crying in the glow or the curse stock in the glow of the crying and oh it's tumbling up i best make sure that escape tower does not hit Ooh, that's pretty close <laughs> anyway as i was saying the, the radiator is on the top and what i like to do is i always like to take some sort of distinctive part and put it at the top of the vessel and then that way if i ever need to or orient the vessel so I know which way's up and which way's left and right and down, then uh, I can do that easily. All right. This is going to be a bit of a trick to... Oh, the sun's up. The sun's up. Oh, oh, now all those... The white goes along. I bet you the curse stock's getting power now. Oh, and in fact, I can tell it stopped spinning, so the reaction wheels must have kicked in. That's going to make uh, connecting to it quite a bit easier. I was getting worried it might end up turning into a challenge trying to connect to something that's spinning, but uh, that problem just went away on its own thanks to Mr. Sun. The might of Kerbal. Okay, I think I am pretty much there. Okay. We'll stop our descent here. I think we're pretty close to stop. There. Bring up the nap ball so I can actually see my speed relative to it. There we go. It's good enough. All right. Come on, Glafia. Let's go up there and hook up some pipes. Okay. Open up the inventory. Equip our wrench, and grab and drag them over there. One, two. I think the curse stock is still close enough. It didn't look like it drifted too far away. Okay. So we'll connect one of them down here at the bottom of this tank. Go connect, then we link to that, and then we got to take our other one and connect it to the curse dock so that these two vessels are connected. Hopefully, it has not drifted too far away. If the pipe goes red, then the connection is no good, and I have to reposition these ships. But so far, we're green, so far, so good. 
I want to be careful not to nudge into it because I might end up pushing it further away if I bang into it. Okay, that should be close enough. Drag over. Okay, connect. There we go, link. Awesome. We are there. In fact, after all of that, I think Lafia is going to pay, pay a visit to the newest member of the Corps of Kerbinauts. We can just find the hatch here in the dark. Oops. Okay, I think I just fell off the ladder. Let's okay, grab and board. Come on, be bored. You can do it. There we go. All right, we're there. Oh, yeah, it did drift quite a ways away. <laughs> oh, I got a notification. What is this? A contract complete. Build a new orbital station around Kerbin. Okay, well, I had this build this orbital station around Kerbin. It's supposed to have power and antenna, and docking port, and house at least five Kerbals. And guess what? This qualifies. Like my space station? Yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? Oh, well, that was kind of funny. Yeah, this, this thing can actually house six Kerbals. I do have an actual space station in the building queue that is on its way here. Uh, and I'm going to bring it up anyway. You'll see it in just a little bit. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing it up too is because it actually has a whole lot of fuel that we're going to use to refuel the Karayan and send it back on its way. But in the meantime, we're going to transfer uh, all of the fuel that the Kerstock can afford to lose and still be able to deorbit itself. And uh, then we're going to deorbit the Kerstock, get Stella down to the surface and recover her thus finishing off that rescue mission contract. And with the completion of those two contracts, uh, I actually had enough money to begin the process of upgrading the tracking station. This is pretty exciting because this will allow me to track unknown objects, find, uh, uh, yeah, unknown object tracking, uh, and that includes asteroids, so hopefully we can do some more little asteroid hunting in the near future. I then time warped into the future just, just a couple of days, a little less than two days, to unlock electronics. And uh, this finally gives me that antenna and allows me to get started with the design of my Duna probe. Now I'm going to put off discussion, discussing the actual design of this thing off until launch day. Um, I want to just move on to other things with this particular episode, but I will let you know that this thing did get pushed into the building queue and it will be built well in time for my Duna launch window. So that will be an exciting thing, but for now we got some other things to get to. Both of these are things that I set up actually a number of episodes ago, so I don't have to spend much time on them. The first being JunkSat 3, and I can't even remember how long ago it was that I first launched this thing. It was, it's been in space now for 23 days, and it was one of these orbital insertion type of missions around Kerbin. And then the plan was to redirect the satellite to go in orbit around the moon, where it will act as a communication relay to help uh, earn a remote tech contract. And what made this one particularly peculiar was that KSP was predicting that I would get my capture for free, that it's going to just insert itself into orbit around the moon without me having to do any kind of capture burn whatsoever, which really confused me at the time. I said that Mr. Newton would have something to say about that, and I kind of still do, though now it is beginning to make a little bit of sense. And you can see even here, as I complete the burn, KSP is still predicting a free capture and I had people saying at the time of that particular video some uh, some posts that were saying um, well yeah well you know objects fall into orbit around objects all the time and they do in real life KSP is not real life um, in real life you have um, multi-body physics and body uh, uh, gravity problems and it's that that is causing these orbital captures most of the time um, KSP doesn't work in that way it works in a patch ponic uh, method. There's only ever two bodies that it's really ever working out the gravity between. Actually, it's really actually ever working the gravity on one body, but I'm not even going to go there. So, it shouldn't happen, but I think I know why it is, and I'm going to talk about it later. I'm going to wait until I actually have my encounter with the moon, which is mere, a mere four days away, 
and then I'm going to talk about why I think I really am going to get this capture for free. I was then off to JunkSat 4, another orbital insertion uh, satellite mission, and another mission that I am transferring over to a different body to act as a communication relay to help me out with a remote tech contract, except this time the other body is Minmus, and, well, JunkSat 4 is ready to perform its capture burn to put it into an orbit of 633.75 kilometers, a circular orbit, that would give it a period of four days and begin to cover Minmus. I'm going to need to get a couple more over here. And in fact, you know, I had to do a little bit of radial burniness to uh, finally tweak my orbit down to what I liked, but got it the way I wanted to. So now it's off to the final mission of this video, the launching of the first module of my space station. Yeah, this guy has been in the building queue for quite some time. It has quite a number of new parts. I guess the most distinctive of which is the uh, four-person hitchhiker can, uh, which is uh, a staple of space stations, I suppose. It has a number of new fuel cans that are, uh, that are on there as well, because part of the mission plan for this thing here is to, be, is to refuel the Karayan. Yeah, this thing has enough fuel on it to refuel the Karayan twice over, so uh, that should keep the Karayan going on its missions for quite some time. One of the other new parts that it has on it as well is this really nice heavy lifting engine that comes from homegrown rockets. Really, really nice orange flame that I see coming out of the bottom of it. Um, it's, uh, let's see, it's a, it's a little, it's a heavier engine than the... Uh, than the skipper engine, more powerful engine than the skipper. Ooh, you probably heard those explosions back there. Yeah, those guys, those boosters aren't exactly coming off cleanly. Uh, I do have separatrons unlocked though soon, so or now so soon you should be able to start to see these boosters coming off in a much more controlled way. But anyway, yeah, that engine um, is not is more powerful than the skipper, but not as powerful as the mainsail. But I haven't unlocked the mainsail yet. And in fact, I haven't unlocked a lot of 2.5 meter parts. I've got to start working on getting more 2.5 meter parts. So right now, this is about the heaviest lifter that I can build. Though it's still not quite as heavy as the good old Corian that was launched uh, a number of episodes ago. It's it, it uh, over 100 tons, but uh, the Corian beat it out. Anyway, the contract that was associated with this was to uh, put a space base station together, uh, a station that could house five Kerbals and have an antenna and power and stuff. Uh, and I ended up fulfilling the requirements of that contract by mistake earlier in this video. But its secondary mission still remained, which is to refuel the Karayan. So propelling the thing right now, we have a Poodle engine at the bottom of that hitchhiker can, which I'm not particularly happy with, to be honest. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't like having engines on my final space station, or at least not big engines like these ones. Uh, I much prefer to build some sort of a transfer vehicle and then shuttle the, you know, the module out there connected to the space station and then deorbit the transfer vehicle. It looks to me a, quite a lot cleaner, but I started to get into issues with payload mass. I just, I just simply was having trouble lifting that much payload up into the air, so I thought simplicity was the best way to go, and I don't know, I'll somehow deal with it later on. But anyway, so it comes time to do our rendezvous, which you've seen me do so many times before. I think it is time to cut straight towards our encounter and talk a little bit about docking. All right, so um, the actual habitat module here has no kind of maneuvering system on it whatsoever. So it is going to be the passive partner in this little coupling here. So I'm just gonna bring it in and bring it to a relative stop, near stop. And I always find turning the orientation so that it is north-south always makes the docking easier. Um, the reason is, is because that north-south orientation won't change as the object orbit orbits around the parent body. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch over to the Karayan, and it's going to be the Karayan that is going to be performing the docking. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is select our docking port, our newly installed docking port, and control from there. So we'll control from here. And uh, frankly, here's where I'm just going to flat out say it. The docking UI 
that's provided with stock sucks. It flat out sucks. Um, so what I got is docking alignment indicator here. It's showing nothing right now because I don't have the station selected. So we use Kerbal Engineer to select the station as a target. And you can see all this information coming up right away. Now the first thing we're going to need to do is orient the Karai in the right way. The space station was oriented north. So this Karai is going to need to point south. Okay, And as you can see, as I come towards the south, you see this big orange target come up. All right, And what I want to do is I want to put that orange target onto the white crosshairs. And when I have that on there, that means I have the planes of the two docking ports perfectly aligned. Now, I don't need to get them quite perfect just yet, so I'm just going to uh, not worry about it. Notice that I also have these red lines. Um, that represents the docking port of the space station. And the reason they are red is because I am behind it. So I am thrusting backwards using RCS and pushing the station northwards, which is up on the screen, so you can think of it as up as well. And uh, the speed at which I am moving up is represented with that CVEL on docking alignment indicator. Right now I'm moving upwards at a speed of 0.4 meters per second, and the CDST is my actual distance above or below the station's docking port. So now I am above, about a meter above the station's docking port, so I'm slowing myself down. And you can see now that the green axis, or sorry, the axis has gone green. It's gone from red to green, so that's indicating now that my docking port is now ahead of, above, north, whatever way you want to think of it, of the station docking port. The other icon I want to draw attention to is what you're used to seeing as the retrograde icon, and it still is the retrograde icon, and that's indicating the direction that the grind is moving relative to the station. And what you want to do is keep that icon uh, between the orange icon that represents the Karayan's docking port and the green axis that represents the docking port of the station. And that means that you are moving towards the station. Now it is a retrograde icon because my central axis velocity is negative 0.01 meter per second or one centimeter per second. So I am moving away from the docking port in a vertical direction very, very slowly. Now that's the notification of my battery short circuit that I don't care. <laughs> uh, so that's why it's retrograde. It'll be prograded once I make that thing positive. And then it's just, you know, you can thrust yourself and get you there uh, more quickly, but I personally just prefer to kind of, you know, take my time and let myself drift that way. And I'm watching that axis and I'm watching the retrograde icon on the docking alignment indicator and keeping it so I can make a straight line between the orange target, the green crosshairs, and the yellow icon. That means you're moving in the right direction. There's one other indicator I want to indi uh, show you, and that is the sort of orange one towards the bottom there. That's indicating the rotation of the vessel. Right now, m the rotation of the two docking ports are pretty close to being 180 degrees from each other. Um, so that's going to look okay once they're docked. It's really handy when you're building things like space stations and stuff and you want everything to line up right. All right, now notice how the green crosshair the, green, the horizontal part of the green crosshair is getting very, very close to the central axis. So that means I'm getting very close to being horizontally uh, correct. So I am using RCS again to push now my prograde yellow icon up. Okay, I'm just about right on the axis, so I move that yellow icon up. And now the horizontal part is fine. And now all i got to do is worry about the vertical part. So now you can see the vertical part of that green axis starting to come towards. And once all these icons are all right on top of each other, that means all the docking ports are, the two docking ports are lined up perfectly. And then it's just a matter of moving down. And by the way, the icon switch from retrograde to prograde because my central axis velocity is now positive 0 0.01 meters per second. So that's pretty much zero. So uh, I'm happy with that. You can also use the nav ball in much the same sort of way, but I find this is so much more precise. So much more a pleasure to dock with this docking alignment indicator. All right, so the green axis, the vertical axis is coming closer, so I'm pushing the prograde icon towards the central white axis with the idea of 
when the green axis gets there, all the icons are all going to be right on top of each other, which is pretty much now. Almost. Oh. And you got to watch it, too, because things will drift apart, of course. And now, let's see, I'm only 0 .8, 0 0.7 meters away. I just got to thrust down very slightly, or thrust to the south, and there we are. We are docked. It was that easy. Now, I do find that once I have vessels docked together with flimsy docking ports, and these are only those uh, Clampatron Juniors, what I like to do is turn off all but one set of reaction wheels. And remember, there are reaction wheels usually in the, in the various capsules as well. So I'm going to turn off these reaction wheels. That capsule doesn't have a reaction wheel. And then that way, the only reaction wheels actually are the reaction wheels that are in the space station there. And I find that reaction wheels sometimes start to fight each other if the connection between the two vessels is pretty flimsy. And that can get a wobble happening in your station, which can be kind of frustrating and sometimes dangerous. It can actually wobble itself right apart. So remember to turn off unnecessary reaction wheels. All right, so there we are. So let's... Uh, you can see there we have a battery that's glowing red. That battery is short-circuited, so we'll deal with that in a little bit. What I want to do first is uh, get Gafli and Jeb over to that uh, hitchhiker can and check out the new digs. These guys, this, this can now actually house eight Kerbals, so they have a lot of elbow room, which is good. All right, let's see if they like their new sword. Look at Jeb. Jeb's like, wow. So much room. Awesome. Looking out the window, I can see the night side of Kerbin, which isn't particularly exciting. Wonder what Glafia thinks. Oh, Glafia likes it as well. So that's good. That's great. All right. Now, Glafia being an engineer and being a level one engineer, I believe she can fix this battery. So we're going to get her out. We're going to get a spare part out of the uh, hitchhiker can. All the capsules, by the way, automatically have spare parts. So that's really great. So you shouldn't, well, eventually, I suppose you will run out of spare parts, but you got a lot of them to get started with. And we're going to go up here. We're going to look for that battery in red. I always like how these batteries just look like double A's. I think that's funny. There we go. Going round and round. There's the red one. Always, always, always going to be the long way around to get to what you're looking for. And then let's see if our level one engineer can fix a battery. Fix a battery. I'm pretty sure because a level two engineer can fix engines for goodness sakes. Oh, I am noticing we are developing a definite tilt. All right, repair the battery. Battery is repaired. Excellent. Which I assume just means she just replaced the batteries. Wouldn't think you would need an engineer for that, but obviously you do. We are definitely tilting over here. As soon as, uh, yeah, I lost focus on the vessel. The vessel does. That's one of the things that really kind of bugs me, actually. Um, and I wish, if you have a probe body on your vessel, and if that probe body is SAS enabled, I mean, I know the Hitchhiker Can is not a command module, right, which is what the problem is here. So I'm going to need to transfer Jeb up to a vessel that actually has command control. So we'll transfer them up there and then we can, then it should be able to stay on it. But it should have stayed anyway. If you have a probe body and that probe body is SAS capable, you shouldn't have to have a Kerbal to keep it locked onto a particular vector. It should stay that way anyway. That's just my opinion anyway. I don't like how it just sort of rotates on its own when there isn't a Kerbal there to keep his hand on the stick. Anyway, all that's left to do now is to refuel the Korion, and then we're going to be sending the Korion off on its next mission. But that's going to have to be for the next episode. In the meantime, I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.